It's interesting because uh, being egocentric, I, I enjoy doing uh, hip replacement and it is remarkable, it's a remarkable procedure. Two weeks after the surgery, these people come back and almost universally say they wish they had done it sooner and, and are, are amazed at how easy the recovery is now and how much better they feel. I think uh, that's in part because they are waiting uh, to the point where they need it uh, and we, we don't indicate them until they need it, but it is a remarkable um, procedure and it's one that I uh, enjoy doing. I would do it every day if I didn't have to go to the office and uh, uh, line people up for it. Um, so having said that, they're, they're, it's evolved over time and, and the reason it's evolved is that uh, early on there was uh, early failure uh, in hip replacement. And even recently, there's been some uh, early failures in hip replacement. And we need to look at that and understand that so we can avoid that. Uh, the beauty of hip replacement and knee replacement now is, is um, not only the functional recovery, but the longevity we expect from these uh, implants. And we need to study uh, the past to understand why uh, things fail and why they failed um, uh, prematurely. And that's what I'll focus on uh, today, as opposed to the, you know, the mechanics of the procedure or the actual uh, indications, which I've talked about in the past. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, evolution of uh, the bearing surfaces in, in hip replacement. Uh, just as some background, why do uh, total joints uh, fail? And there's a number of reasons. Um, there can be early catastrophic failure from technical errors. Um, from uh, trauma, a number of different issues. But the one that we focus on in terms of trying to, um, and it has the most impact, is the issue of, of wear and loosening. Uh, historically, uh, these components were cemented into place. And that worked well initially, but eventually the, the bond between the cement uh, and the bone, or the cement and the implant, broke down. And uh, that led to failure. Um, so over time, uh, we've realized that we can avoid the use of cement. And, and now, um, it's, uh, I don't remember the last time I used cement in a total hip replacement. Uh, we count on um, the bone to ingrow into the components uh, and the longevity of that and the, 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 um, um, of that is, is dramatically improved over uh, the use of cement. Uh, so that's, that's one area where we've made a lot of uh, progress and that's something that uh, most of us who do a lot of joint replacement now really focus on um, these implants that are not, or cement is not necessary. Uh, the second issue um, that we discover that why things were failing uh, before we hoped is this concept of uh, osteolysis. And it's kind of a fancy word. And what it means is the, the eroding away or the, uh, um, of the bone. And that's usually in response to uh, wear particles. So all hip replacements, uh, no matter what surface they are, generate wear particles uh, in, the, in the body. Whenever you have two surfaces rubbing together, um, you're going to create debris and wear, and uh, that's um, understood, and the body uh, has been, uh, is miraculous in that it can deal with that generally, but once it gets to a certain point, um, that w the wear particles can generate uh, responses that can be harmful to the, the surrounding structures. So um, what happened uh, historically is that uh, polyethylene was really the primary um, uh, socket uh, surface that we used, and uh, over time, the, the polyethylene would, would break down, the small wear particles would be there in the body, and then the body tried to uh, deal with these particles, usually by having some kind of inflammatory response to them. Uh, that inflammatory response um, uh, generated some um, enzymes and things that would, would wear away the bone and, and loosen the implants. And so it's, um, uh, these, uh, this response is what we're concerned about, so the efforts have been directed at decreasing the number of uh, particles or, the, infl or the, um, uh, the way that they incite the uh, inflammatory response. Um, one dramatic shift in that has been in the, in the change in the polyethylene uh, over time. Uh, they found when they uh, studied this very closely that by in certain sterilization processes of, of getting this uh, polyethylene ready for the body, it, it tended to weaken the, the, the bonds in the, in the, uh, in the polyethylene that uh, led to an increase in the volume of, of wear in these particles in the body. And so they've changed the process of sterilization now uh, to generate these links uh, between this, uh, the, the monomers uh, in, the, in the polyethylene. And that's dramatically dropped uh, the amount of uh, 
of where debris uh, over time uh, in patients. More recently, um, there's been some concerns and some catastrophic uh, failures uh, in hip replacement, a lot of which has to do with uh, some metal-on-metal -metal, uh, couplings. I'll get into more detail. There's also some been, been some issues involving ceramics with uh, uh, the squeaking hips. Um, and this has generated just an enormous amount of litigation and, and problems for uh, patients, uh, problems for uh, uh, doctors, the manufacturers of these implants. Um, as a matter of fact, if you Google metal on metal hips, you will get nothing scientific. You will get an uh, incredible number of uh, lawyers uh, looking for uh, uh, fodder for lawsuits. So I did that the other day just to get a sense of uh, what information is out there, and you cannot get any real scientific information easily if you Google metal on metal hips. You get uh, referred to uh, many, many different law firms. So the problem is wear and loosening. Uh, these components, once they get uh, loose, and you can picture if the, your uh, replaced hip starts rattling around in the bone, it's not going to work well. Um, in addition to um, loosening, you can get these other responses around the uh, around the bone and around the hips, there's something called uh, pseudotumors that's a, that have uh, been diagnosed. And that's kind of a strange name for when you get a hip replacement, how do you get a pseudotumor? Uh, in particular with metal on metal uh, prostheses, but also with uh, now the, the tradi more traditional polyethylene, these pseudotumors have uh, been recognized and they can be uh, quite large um, and can compress other things around the, the hip joint. Um, there, we don't fully understand the formation of these um, uh, uh, bodies. Um, there's some inflammatory component to it. There's, there's a possible lymphocytic component to it, uh, a vascular, uh, vasculitis type component to it. But the, the bottom line is that we're creating, uh, or the debris is creating this reaction, and the body, I think, in a sense, is trying to wall off this reaction, and you get this um, uh, mass uh, around the hip. Uh, I've uh, operated on one of these that um, was truly enormous. I mean, it was, it was, um, it had kind of, pseudotumor had formed to the inside part of this patient's uh, thigh, and I would say is, is um, almost the size of like a half a basketball had sort of uh, generated into this uh, area. And when I went and started pulling stuff out of there, you don't recognize, you know, what this, all this debris that's coming out. Uh, we took some pictures just because it was, uh, interesting, but the, just the relief from, from uh, removing the pseudotumor from the patient's uh, uh, thigh was dramatic because you can imagine the compressive effects that these, uh, these soft tissue meshes can have on the uh, surrounding tissue. Um, the other issue that we don't uh, have a real grasp on yet is the importance of when this material gets into the, the blood and what this means. So um, in hip replacement, there's uh, all hip replacements contain some, some metal, and there's, so there's some metal uh, debris generated uh, in hip replacement. And some of this gets into the serum, and it can be uh, measured. And we don't uh, fully understand the importance of that yet. Is that. Does that have an impact on a patient's health, a dramatic impact? We don't know. Does that promote cancer? We don't, we don't know that for sure. There's a lot of theories, there's a lot of study going into this. Um, but particularly with metal-on-metal -metal, um, interactions, and higher concentrations of serum uh, ions, you start to worry about the systemic uh, complications and systemic problems that can uh, uh, develop from these uh, things. So um, uh, everyone's scared, you know, what, what, what does this mean? You get these, uh, these debris particles and they're going and creating these pseudotumors and this, you know, uh, ions in the blood. What, what do we do to sort of try to prevent this? So it started kind of an arms race among the uh, manufacturers to come up with a better surface, a better connection between the ball uh, and the socket. And there's been a number of different uh, surfaces created. Uh, there's uh, uh, metal on polyethylene, and I mentioned the, the newer polyethylene that we uh, use. There's been the use of ceramics, and uh, ceramic both in terms of coupling it with um, polyethylene or coupling it with a ceramic surface, or, or what we call a hard on hard, hard bearing. And that sounds uh, strange when you think of ceramics. You know, I think of my you know, grandmother's china, um, and that seems like a fragile uh, substance. But the reality is, um, I have some uh, of these balls here. It's a very hard surface, and it's a very polished surface, and uh, it's a very low friction surface. Um, and so theoretically, um, you would think that that's uh, 
uh, could work well because it's um, when you look at the surface characteristics of uh, ceramics, uh, that um, seems ideal for hip replacement. Uh, in addition, uh, we've come up with um, uh, these metal on metal constructs. And again, that sounds strange. How can, how can a, a metal ball um, uh, work with a metal socket or a metal liner? And they're very, very highly polished, and the body creates a, a, a lubricant or fluid film between these surfaces. And so it, it's amazing, uh, when you look at the studies and the, the debris that's generated from these, how much it's dramatically reduced in, in the ceramics and the metal on metal and these hard on hard, hard bearing surfaces uh, compared to more traditional. And a lot of that just, just has to do with the surface characteristics of these um, uh, components. Now, um, there's this race to come up with a better uh, 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 surface or a better coupling, but there's um, potential issues with these as well, and we've started to see that over time. Uh, there's a rush to get these uh, onto the market. Uh, they've been used in Europe. Um, like everything else, things in Europe can get to market quicker, and uh, you know the early results are promising, so there's a push to get them to market. And um, the problems um, on the big scale are not great. I mean, the, the we use ceramics, we use metal on metal, we use metal on poly, and, and the vast majority of hip replacements do fine and do not have uh, problems with wear and, and are lasting a, a long time. But there are small subsets that seem to have major problems and catastrophic problems, and we have to look at those and understand why uh, that's happening and uh, try to fix that. Um, in particular uh, is this metal on metal uh, phenomenon. Um, in hip resurfacing, uh, which is a slightly different procedure than uh, hip replacement where the, uh, the ball is resurfaced as opposed to removed, um, there's been a, a very high rate of failure in a certain subset of uh, patients, in particular one implant design uh, in Britain they discovered had a very high rate of early failure uh, with these. And it was thought to be due to some uh, issues with that implant, but there's also some issues that have to do with uh, the size of the heads of these implants. They're much larger, and that creates more volumetric wear. Uh, also, um, there's some issues technically about how these are put in, and the manufacturers will argue that that's a more important issue. If, if they're technically put in uh, slightly off, there can be a little bit of impingement. We learned a lot about hip impingement with a natural hip. You can have impingement with... Um, hip resurfacing as well as with hip replacement. <coughs> and that you can um, uh, imagine would create more debris just if the, if the components are uh, bumping up against each other. Um, so as a result of these uh, kind of catastrophic early uh, uh, failures, uh, the metal on metal uh, hip replacement market has really dropped to nothing. I mean, there's very few metal on metal hip replacements done. Um, the scope of the problem is unknown at this point. There's a lot of patients out there who have metal on metal couplings um, and the vast majority are fine and have no idea that this, this uh, is an issue uh, unless um, they're, they're aware of what they have in and they've contacted their lawyer and then all of a sudden uh, uh, things change. But uh, why do some of them fail? And we think uh, some of it could be um, the way things are positioned, there's more impingement that could lead to problems. We think there's certain implants that have a higher rate of failure. And then the third issue, which is much more difficult to understand, is that I think certain patients have an immune response to these particles and to this debris that leads to failure. And that has yet to be um, elucidated. No one knows quite sure what that is, but I think there's a subset of patients that uh, will fail early uh, because of their, um, their immune uh, type of reaction to the, to the uh, debris particles. And I think the same thing was true to a certain extent with the polyethylene particles. I think there's subsets of patients who have um, uh, immune issues. And they've, uh, people are trying to study that and try to understand that if, uh, if they can come up with a test, a skin test, or something to understand that who, who's at risk for that, but no one's been able to quite figure that out uh, yet. So what's the uh, solution to all these uh, problems? Well, first of all, if we get better at putting them in uh, and there's no impingement, that's going to uh, remove one major source of, um, of debris. And um, that, uh, uh, I think, occurs on a, a, a regular basis. Uh, as we become more and more specialized, uh, folks do more and more of a uh, smaller number of procedures. I think, uh, in general, that just makes sense that they get better at it, and, the, and, and placing these in the correct position uh, ha is improving over time. There's a lot of courses offered by the academy and other organizations to try to improve uh, surgical techniques uh, so that um, 
we don't have the issue with uh, impingement. Uh, there's, uh, again, the <coughs> manufacturers have a, a strong financial incentive to come up with uh, solutions to this, uh, both um, in terms of, the, you know, the future market of this, but also um, uh, to avoid, uh, uh, you know, legal issues and, and um, uh, that have come up recently. And then what we do as physicians is for patients who have hip replacement, and it's very important to monitor them over time. There's sort of this feeling that the hip feels great, I don't need to see my doctor, you know, uh, there's no, no reason to follow up with a hip replacement uh, over time. But that's really not true. Even though the hip is doing well, you can uh, catch things early with um, a clinical exam or radiograph, the patient may be totally asymptomatic, but if you notice that something is, uh, um, is, seems to be wearing thin, uh, you, one thing about hip replacement is very easy to look at is that the uh, femoral head is concentrically placed within the socket just by the nature of the design of these implants. And over time, if, that's, if it's no longer concentric, if the head starts to migrate, you know that that, that, that liner is, is wearing. And so um, not infrequently for patients who are done in the 90s, they'll come in and I'll look at their um, hip and tell them that they should think about a hip revision even though they're asymptomatic because you can picture as the ball wears through this um, uh, polyethylene, uh, if it gets to the point where it gets to the, the, the metal liner and the, the metal ball starts rubbing on this, then you get that disaster case like Dr. Kamenow had on Monday where it's all the metal debris just uh, um, uh, goes everywhere and it causes a big problem. So if we watch them clinically over time and radiographically uh, study it uh, every few years, we can catch those early and do a relatively minor revision surgery uh, to help them. And then ultimately, when a hip fails, it needs to be revised. And, um, we do a fair amount of uh, revision uh, surgery here. It's more difficult than the primary surgery. It's more uh, difficult for the patient. Uh, there's more uh, complications associated with it. And, uh, but it's necessary to get these people back on their uh, feet. We have uh, ways to fix um, these problems. The, the technology is really advanced in revision surgery so that we can, um, when there's deficits created in the bone from this concept of osteolysis and the wear problems, we can fill those, fix it, and get people back on their feet. Uh, but the goal, obviously, is to um, avoid that. And hopefully, uh, over time, as these uh, um, uh, materials improve, uh, we won't uh, have this uh, issue with wear. So in summary, hip replacement's a, a wonderful operation. Um, uh, we do uh, have to look at it critically and understand when it, it fails and when it fails early, why it fails early, and try to fix that. Uh, for patients, um, but the bottom line is, um, uh, although everyone's trying to avoid me, I think it's a, a reasonable solution for a lot of people.